In the previous video, we've seen how to hack processes using ptrace, the Linux system call. We created a simple process that consisted of an endless while loop. We hacked process memory changing the loop's predicate to fail the loop condition test and managed to leave the endless cycle. As ptrace is a fairly low-level function, I had to write an interactive layer above it, allowing us to do various ptrace requests once we attach to the process and on each single instruction step. Making a tool more interactive is not to be underestimated as it is a greatly facilitates exploration and just trying things out. That's why in this video we will consider to use the programming language Common Lisp. We will see that with its image-based interactive approach to programming, Lisp lends itself greatly to this explorative purpose. We will see how to use ptrace from Lisp using a foreign function interface. ptrace is part of a C library called libc. In order to make Lisp say a foreign word like ptrace, we need to use a so-called foreign function interface, which in essence allows us to call library code written in another language from Lisp. So the final goal will be to have this tracer again use system calls to control the tracy. Now we want Lisp to become a fit enough tracer so it can use syscalls in the first place. And let's go ahead and let's do this. So conceptually we will divide the screen into left, this is the tracer process and its programs and whatever, and on the right we have the tracy. So again we have this endless loop here and we are monitoring it. So let's go right ahead and start creating the bindings from the bottom up. So we will use a, a Lisp REPL for this, which is just a system to load code and well evolve our process along the way. And like in any good cooking show or already pre-cooked a bunch of stuff. So basically what we will be using is this library CFFI, the current for, common foreign function interface. And with this, we just use two steps. The first one is we use define foreign library, which just tells the system where on the machine it can find the libc library, just where the file is, where the so file is. And you see I have a bunch of uh, paths um, spammed in here, so in order that this code works on multiple machines. And the second step, once you tell the system where it can find the library, we use this function, use foreign library, which actually loads the library, the, the binary blob into the Lisp image. So this will look something like this. So here we have our Lisp process, right? And through our REPL, we will dynamically, at runtime, load the libc library, this binary blob, into the process memory of our tracer, of our Lisp process. And once, uh, once it is inside the process memory, we will use CFFI to access uh, the function to define it therein, for example, ptrace. So let's go right ahead and create some bindings. So I already loaded this file here. So that means uh, the Lisp image now running has this libc with, within its guts. So we can start creating bindings. And we do this with this, this function devcfun, which allows us to create bindings on the fly. So what we provide is the name. For example, if we want to provide a, a binding to the function clock, we just uh, name it clock. Then the next argument is, uh, look down here, is the return type and some optional arguments if there are some. So clock just re returns system type or something like that. So now we define the function and we can start using it. So by the way, quick thing, where other programming languages write functions like so, in Lisp we enclose them like so. So now we can invoke it and we see it already works. So let's say a, a little bit more involved function, for example, um, the absolute function, which uh, takes an integer and an argument. We can now provide any name you want. So for example, a number of type int, and this won't work because we want to create a function called apps, but the Lisp image, uh, the common Lisp library already has a standard defined function apps. So we can easily, create an alias with this syntax here. So let's call it absolute defined and we can go ahead and start using bindings. It's that easy. We're already there. So now for a more involved example, uh, let's create uh, the bindings to ptrace itself. 
So there are some caveats here, some tricks you have to know. So basically, let me walk you through this. So here's the signature of, of C, right? So first off, uh, we have to provide an enum. So an enum, we can easily get by this by simply uh, mapping this request enum to an integer and we're done because in the background enums are just some constants. Now, the second thing is that we have this process ID, which is of, of a type pit underscore T. Now, all these uh, user defined types, so to speak, are mapped to some uh, some internal type in the end. And we do this uh, actually here with def C type, where we met, map, we, where we create some new type pit minus T and map it to long. And now we can provide a process ID to be of type pit minus T, or, or in other words, long. Okay, so the next two are uh, void pointers. And this is pretty neat for CFFI. We don't need to create any integer byte or any special kind of pointer, we just call them pointers. And only when we actually use them, when we want to dereference the pointer, that's where we provide the type. So that's basically it. So you see, I already created, <laughs> I just uh, jumped my cursor down here. We already created all kinds of functions. We created the wait pit function, the kill function, etc., etc., etc. And that's already it. We can start using ptrace. So again, uh, in C, it would be something like this ptrace, um, the enum ptrace attach the process ID, so in this case, 5828. Uh, so we uh, don't use the other three, third and fourth argument. So that's what it would look like in C. And a Lisp, we, um, well, the parenthesis goes here, in the beginning, like so. Uh, we don't use commas, we just use space to separate. Uh, the enum, we just map them to, to numbers. So in this case, let me, uh, look up attach real quick. So here we have, uh, we defined a constant, ptrace attach, and we just know from looking inside the ptrace.h header file that it maps to 16. And so we can use some meaningful um, constant here. Then now comes the process ID. So this is still right. And now null, well null are null pointers. CFFI provides us the function null pointer to make uh, to take care of that. And I already mapped this to, to a constant as well, namely, well, uh, null itself, right? And that's all, all it is. So if I press enter, it will stop this process. But uh, I have written a more convenient function, namely attach to, which does all of this itself. So let's quickly look inside attach to. You see here, it uh, gives us some feedback and in the back, it's basically just the same thing, right? It's this uh, clear cute function here. And it is, this is something I didn't go into, but ptrace is actually should be a kind of, it sends some signal and we wait for the behavior of a process to stop. So we want to use p, uh, wait pit in the background to kind of make sure that it actually stopped. That's just some kind of a uh, secure book uh, bookkeeping you need to do when you deal with processes. Right, so let's do this, attach to, and we can now provide the uh, process ID. And we can start attaching to it. Let's go, let's see here, status train H to T, CPU drop to zero, indeed it is now traced. So now we can start uh, reading out the process ID. So we will provide a request like peak data and I abstracted this neatly away into this function pick data itself. Down here you see the signature. So let's read out the byte offset, for example, for 100,000. Um, now the process ID. And you see something here. Um, I have optional arguments. Optional arguments. So it means if I don't provide any uh, arguments, they will default to the right hand side of this uh, of this parenthesis, they will default to this PID variable. And this is the global variable that I carry around that we should actually uh, assign the process we want to uh, deal with uh, any subsequent function. In. So we use set F, this assignment operator. And now if we use peak data, we can just type in 400,000 without specifying any process ID. In the background, it will automatically use this 5828 to refer to it. So let's go. Let's read out some process memory. All right. Uh, so let's uh, quickly recapitulate our hack from last time. So let's uh, enter some step loop. The same thing. We see here's our instruction pointer. We can keep on stepping. Let's find our value of interest from the last time. A, B, C, D. There it is. Our uh, loop conditional. Uh, loop predicate. Uh, so let's quit. 
I have this function written here, uh, instruction pointer address, so it will return us the address so that we can pick data from this address and see there's our uh, immediate um, mode representation of the uh, while loop predicate. So let's poke it, poke data. And this one is a little bit more conveniently written. We just have to uh, provide the numbers, uh, the data we actually want to override. So to write ABCD, we can provide this DADA. We don't have to provide the whole thing and replace it with just ABCD. And the background just does some uh, bit masking to uh, realize the same thing with the primitive function. So let's go right ahead, poke data, something went wrong. And so I just did some typo here. And that's the, the neat thing with Lisp. It doesn't crash immediately, it drops into the debugger. So we can try to fix this thing so either you read this or you just know what you made wrong. Let's see. Um, I didn't provide two arguments. I had to provide the byte offset that I want to write to and the data I want to write to. So I can push Q here to quit the debugger. And now this read evaluate print loop, our listener, uh, pretends like I never passed this form into it. So it never crashed, so to speak. So we can try this again. Look down here. The data is what provided. We need to still provide the byte offset. And that's our instruction pointer address. So let's go right ahead. Let's peek data and see if our process writing worked. And indeed, it changed to DADA. So now we can detach from the loop. We also have some cute function for that. Detach from. And let's see if we get uh, the thing from last time. Ta-da! Left the endless loop because flag is 43981. And it worked. And that's how we deal with Lisp. So alas, showing binding creation and Lisp in action took longer than expected. So I have to conclude this video here. I actually shot the last screencast like five times, but I couldn't get it shorter without leaving out some important details. That means that all the real fun stuff gets shoved into the next video. That's when we will be actually hacking some games. I will show some what techniques worked. We will tell you about uh, Linux processes and their properties and what you need to know to make this feasible in the first place. Uh, all the code I'm using, by the way, is uh, available on GitHub. I've put a link into the description. And if you don't want to miss the next video, then go ahead and subscribe. If you want to give me some feedback, leave a comment or give a like if you want to see more of these kind of videos in the future. Take care and see you in the next video.